Nordic Rebels Season 3 Skills for the Future. Um, when was the last time you actually checked you know, these lists telling you what kind of skills you need for the future? So you need creativity, analytical thinking, interdisciplinary knowledge, emotional intelligence, leadership skills, technology skills, skill skills, the lists, they just go on. But is it really about like ticking the boxes or establishing something long term, something more positive or something actually that changes in your body? That's what season three is going to be all about. So enjoy First the ride. If we remain passive, um, we might be approaching um, quite challenging times. If you don't take action, you're going to be like him. Passive. <laughs> okay. Um, so how did I come about doing this research? Well, I'm not going to tell you the long story, but um, I have backgrounds in a diversity of, of disciplines. So uh, I did my bachelor in engineering, then my master's in industrial design, which was when I uh, started to uh, research about sustainability and design. Then I did my PhD in sustainability science, which is about um, complex systems. Um, well, the action needs to happen at least three levels, kind of all together create new systems, uh, new sustainable systems. So change at the level of the individual, change at the level of policy and change at the level of technologies, infrastructures and, and pretty much the, you know, everything that, that uh, human society creates and builds. We call this transitions in socio-technical systems, and um, this is particularly, of course, in the in the context of sustainability, uh, it's it's referred to as sustainability transitions. But socio-technical transitions happened in the past uh, when we did not have a sustainability concern. Um, so one good example that's very often, I think, uh, used is um, how, how we have transitioned from horse and carriage to automobiles. Of course, when you look at it as horse and carriage and automobiles, you're looking at products of, of you know, product, products that we use for mobility or products that are used for transportation. And on one hand, uh, technologically, they're very different products, but on their own, they're actually, to a large extent, um, useless. Particularly automobile is useless, uh, but also horse and carriage because it needs, um, it needs a certain, uh, certain path, um, even if it's not you know, asphalt covered. It still needs a smooth enough path to 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 go along. So we talk about a transition from horse and carriage uh, to automobiles, but we're actually talking about a huge transformation of the transportation system that that also required changes on um, on. First of all, development of new auxiliary technologies, but also new regulations, policies. We needed to invent a whole um, traffic signage system, for example. We needed um, regulations. Uh, and, and just as it's happening at the moment with autonomous vehicles, the ethical questions that are being asked about you know, responsibilities, probably back in the day, 
people were talking about um, talking about uh, responsibilities uh, and liabilities and, and ethical issues that that may um, that may come with such a huge transition. So it's not a transition from an horse, horse and carriage to automobiles. It's a transition of of the whole mobility um, socio-technical system. So that's an example from past. Uh, but now we are talking about socio-technical transitions in the context of sustainability. And um, at the moment, there is one particular transition that's happening. Uh, that's quite important, uh, for, for particularly for addressing climate change. And that's the transition that's going on in energy, energy system. And of course, uh, we, we are striving to move from a fossil fuel based uh, energy system to an energy system that is um, that is sourced by renewable resources. Of course, this means um, new technologies, new regulations, um, new infrastructures, new um, new behaviors as well. Uh, an example of infrastructure is uh, with fossil fuels. Uh, we needed for our el electricity. We needed uh, more or less a central system, but with renewable energy, because we can produce renewable energy in smaller as well as larger scales, we could um, actually deploy highly distributed energy systems. And then, of course, um, all sorts of renewable energy technologies, uh, wind energy, tide um, energy, solar energy, and all of these have their own uh, products, but also business models, etc. So this is, I think, uh, this is a very, very good and, and current example of socio-technical transitions in, in, in relation to sustainability. Quite often, because we talk about large systems, um, people think that it has not much to do with them. Um, because they don't think that they have the agency to change systems. Well, first of all, these systems um, are not are not changed in a kind of hierarchical and managed way. Uh, we can at best steer them, but not have full control over over the change process. So, for example, a recent report uh, undertaken uh, in collaboration with Citra and the researcher here in Department of Design, um, it was found that households have a significant share in producing carbon dioxide emissions. So, individuals actually uh, contribute quite a lot to, um, to Finland's emissions. And when you kind of break it down to why, where is this coming from, um, we can actually influence quite a lot of change by changing our day-to-day -day habits, such as what we eat, uh, where we buy our products from. This includes both food, but also clothing, um, or whether we buy them or whether we, we rent them or whether we use you know secondhand stuff etc how we commute um, individual car ownership is becoming less and less cool but increasingly more we are moving into a mobility system for active transport for um, public transport becoming even better um, but also kind of clearing our cities from cars because if you, you know, if you have autonomous vehicles, then you can bring them into an urban context on demand without someone having to drive them. Then you can open up all of those car parks for all sorts of um, community related activities, etc. So our, um, our commute and how we commute from one place to the other um, affects, uh, affects quite a lot. I mean, in general, transport has a big share in, in at global level in, in carbon dioxide emissions. Flight is also, of course, um, 
a big contributor. So choosing land transport when we can rather than flying. In Alto, we are talking about um, we're talking about reducing our uh, flight uh, flight carbon dioxide emissions by way of um, not taking uh, not taking flights that are unnecessary, uh, but also utilizing uh, technologies that help people to meet online rather than being you know physically present in 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 one place. So there are a lot that every individual can do both in their work and, and their home life but also um, you need kind of you need um, supportive uh, structures um, around around yourself but really basic what you eat um, how you commute how much you consume what you consume and minimizing that, of course, um, are, are simple but very, very uh, necessary and effective steps that individuals can take. Sometimes people think of sustainability as a very uh, hippie thing. What would you say to that? First of all, there's nothing wrong in being hippie. Um, it's just a matter of what people value for themselves. Sustainability is hip and it will become increasingly more hip um, because that's the only sensible way. Sustainability is, is not, first of all, a luxury. It's a necessity. Two, uh, it's not idealistic. Uh, it's totally doable. And three, um, every sensible, I think, person knows that we need a balance of, we need to make use of emerging technologies. Uh, it's, not, it's not about rejecting technology. I mean, humans have developed technologies since probably they have stood on their own, t own foot. So there's nothing wrong about technology and sustainability is not about um, no technology future, but sustainability is about um, asking questions on how can we make the, you know, the best use of emer emerging technologies in creating these new socio-technical systems in a way that is not going to basically destroy the life support systems that this earth has, both for us and also for millions and millions of species. <sighs> Um, and I integrated in my PhD, I integrated uh, my background in design with uh, my, at the time, current research uh, in sustainability science. And, and sustainability science is about long term transformations. Um, and it's, uh, I mean, sustainability transformations require collaboration of academic experts but also experts from outside of academia uh, with a solution-oriented approach. And when you think about it like this, it's actually uh, design on its own. Um, so for me, it was very natural that design and sustainability science were uh, kind of sides of the same, different sides of the same coin. And also, sustainability science puts a lot of emphasis on transdisciplinary research and um, transdisciplinary research requires skills for synthesizing knowledge and co-creating knowledge and those kind of things. And of course, in design, design theory and practice are very familiar with um, even if, you know, even if design did not talk about transdisciplinarity explicitly, design is about synthesizing knowledge and it's about co-creating knowledge. So I think they're, they're, they're very good companions. And so I'm using, uh, I'm using what I have started uh, in my PhD, which is integrating design and sustainability transitions and transformations 
um, and I'm building on, on that in my research and also in my teaching. Thank you. Thank you, Teddy. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, it's not